Okay. All right. Well, without stealing too much of Jay's time, I just want to thank you all for coming today and seeing that. Uh, the multimedia extravaganza. <laughs> uh, so Jay came to us. He was a master's student at Humboldt State with uh, uh, the wonderful Harvey Kelsey. And uh, as a paleoseismologist, he came here in 2007 and um, has done a, a really tremendous job. The first job at AMJ was to design a, a, um, a shock absorber for the coring system, which had been losing cores due to uh, having a relatively small wire and relatively high lows. And Jay said, I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we worked together with an engineer, and we got it built, and it actually worked. So I've been impressed with Jay's uh, repertoire of skills all along, and he's done it. So, without further ado, thanks. Uh, of course, many of you might have missed the the sound, the music that was playing. Uh, it was from a, a group of people that live around uh, Lake Toba, which is a, a caldera formed by the largest quaternary <laughs> eruption to the last two million years. Let's see here in a lecture. Largest quaternary eruption in the world formed that caldera. And the, the music we're listening to is by the people from the people that live in there. So my name is Jay Patton. You know, already introduced me. And uh, for the last few years, I've been riddling the sea floor for evidence of earthquakes and submarine landslides. And I'd like to thank uh, my advisor, Chris Goldfinger, for bringing funding from the National Science Foundation and uh, our college here and BPPT, which is the uh, geological institute in Indonesia that permitted our uh, ship in their water. And here's one of the first maps, European maps, of uh, Sumatra from the late 1500s. And uh, so we all recognize some of the definitions of real, uh, piercing with numerous holes, or solved or explained. A few, few days ago I learned that it also means to put gravel or sand through a sieve. So I thought that was pretty appropriate, but I'm not going to discuss these other definitions of riddle. So here's my outline uh, for the talk. I'll tell you why I'm uh, doing this work, um, what the hypothesis is. Uh, I'll go through the sediment coring and age modeling techniques. And I did some uh, landslide and ground motion modeling for the subduction zone there. And then, uh, so my talk will be grouped in A and B, two different uh, groups. And then I'll talk about the results and discuss those results. And uh, for those of you who might fall asleep, although I'm a pretty loud speaker, uh, the conclusions are, I think that we've cored the 2004 seismo turbidite. If you don't know what that means, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But you can imagine what seismo means. And, uh, and I've come up with an earthquake recurrence in the, the northern part of the subduction zone. And I think I have a handle on uh, what the ground motions and geomorphology, how they're controlling sedimentary deposition uh, offshore Sumatra. And uh, here's a more recent map from 18, 1850s, and now we see that the mm -hmm. island of Sumatra is starting to look like how it really looks like. And I would like everyone to put their mud whispering hats on because we will be whispering <laughs> to the mud and asking answers. This is from an intro geology class, a sketch they made of me. But more importantly, <laughs> <laughs> similar to ge you know, geophysics and seismology and other science, geological sciences where we can actually make direct observations, using sedimentology as a proxy for geological processes relies on non-unique solutions. And of course, we always start our talk with a statement of the problem. And I hope that uh, people who are starting their graduate degrees get a manual. <laughs> and so here's the introduction slide. And so the reason why uh, we study earthquakes is because that they are damaging to people and their possessions. And uh, we're interested in uh, tectonics because we want to find out how big these earthquakes are going to be, how frequently they occur, and do they occur the same size in the same place in the same location each time or not. And so the main question that we have is do these great earthquakes generate strong ground shaking sufficient to trigger 
uh, turbidity currents, submarine landslides, and <coughs> deposits uh, provide stratigraphic evidence for the earthquake history for the subduction zone offshore Sumatra. And can this sedimentary evidence tell us something about the spatiotemporal relations for rupture on the megathrust? So those are our questions. Here's, here's a um, sort of a cutaway view of a subduction zone fault where we have oceanic subducting crust, subducting beneath the continental crust, uh, and then there's some sediment involved. And uh, I put this here to show you that uh, we think that fault zones are heterogeneous, so in some places they are more rough, in some places they are smoother, and that seems to control the size of earthquakes. Uh, rough faults, uh, these seamounts or fracture zones, uh, tend to localize strain, stress and uh, uh, cause uh, smaller earthquakes and may arrest propagation of larger earthquakes that are probably <coughs> related to areas of uh, smoother fault interfaces, possibly generated by a thick incoming sediment cover. Uh, but of course, there are no little elves running around the fault, so we have to use paleoseismology and other techniques to try to characterize the faults and, and look into the past to see uh, if these, um, if these uh, fault characteristics control rupture through time. And after we've recorded thousands of earthquakes and ground motion records from these earthquakes, we've uh, realized that uh, the, sh the ground motions, the shaking intensity here, peak ground acceleration, the highest uh, acceleration recorded during an earthquake, measured in units of G, uh, gravity, uh, we can see here for these four different earthquake magnitudes that the uh, ground shaking diminishes with the distance from the fault. So that's a very important um, observation that we've made over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. So this is where we're going to be uh, today, <coughs> offshore Sumatra. Here's the island of Sumatra. And I put this here to show how we have the, the uh, Indo-Australia plate is subducting north, northeasterly beneath the Sunda plate forming the subduction zone here, and I've plotted uh, slip contours for the 2004 and 2005 earthquakes. You can see that they have slip maxima up to over 20 meters in places and slip minima. And uh, I've also uh, put this slide here to mention that the trench, the deepest part in this part of the world, uh, deepens from four and a half to six and a half kilometers, and that's below the carbonate compensation depth the depth at which foraminifera tests calcium carbonate, uh, they dissolve faster than they are deposited, and they are the source of carbon for our rated carbon ages. So we cannot use rated carbon analysis in the trench, and we have to go to shallower uh, position um, core sites to get rated carbon control. And also, here we have the Bengal and the Nicobar fans that are thicker in the north and they fit into the south, and that may control uh, seismogenesis and, and the, along the subduction zone. And here's a cross section showing us an oblique view of that uh, plate down going underneath the upper plate. And you can see that there are these uh, accretionary prism faults that are uplifting uh, the region, causing the, these depot centers, accommodation space where sediments are collected, and those are where we're coring also uh, to find with a rated carbon age. Uh, material. So uh, there are two slides I'm uh, showing here. This is one of them that uh, represents the instantaneous fault heterogeneity. Remember those faults uh, are not homogeneous. And so in plan view, this is another uh, view of the uh, slip, where there is more slip with the warmer colors. And, uh, and then this is a uh, 2D profile of the moment release, or the energy released during the earthquake with latitude, and you can see how it's heterogeneous. There are min maxima and minima that relate to the ma maxima and minima in plan view. And then uh, the subduction zone also has a long-term uh, heterogeneity, and uh, where we see this igneous province in the downgoing slab is uh, causing a salient in the fault, and so this may uh, be a site for smaller earthquakes, or it might be a uh, termination for larger earthquakes. And then we also see some strike-slip faults that are in the down-going plate 
that uh, due to the fault to, due to the locking along the mega thrust are propagating upward into the accretionary prism. So we've got two uh, time scales showing heterogeneity of the fault. And then here is our sort of our big picture uh, concept slide uh, showing how we have an earthquake in the subsurface that uh, generates ground motions. These seismic waves propagate through the crust and the sediment until they reach the surface where there might be some slopes that are predisposed to fail, uh, causing triggering submarine landslides that transform downslope into a turbidity currents that eventually get deposited. And so uh, these turbidites that get deposited down here are the sedimentary deposits that, we're, uh, that, we've been, that we cord. So speaking of landslides and slope stability, what's driving uh, slope stability? And people who study landslides generally consider this force balance between the driving force, the downward driving force, and the resisting force along a certain slope angle. And so whenever the driving force exceeds the resisting force, the factor safety is less than one, and that slope is unstable. So all the slope stability modeling that I do is based on this very simple principle, a force balance principle. So here's an example where we have uh, an earthquake of uh, magnitude 7.9 in Wenchuan in uh, 2008. This is a, a <coughs> slip model for that earthquake showing higher slip in red. And if we look at the landslide concentration map, we can see that uh, not only is the fault slip heterogeneous, so is the landslide concentration Although it's not a direct uh, correlation with the slip, so that there are probably some other factors that are controlling slope stability, not just uh, landslides or uh, earthquakes. And uh, I threw this in here to show what uh, the slope looks like, um, the Krishnaya prism looks like, offshore Sumatra. Uh, here are those uh, strike slip faults we looked at that are propagating into the Krishnaya prism. And we have these faults that are uplifting uh, the, the accretionary prism and creating these basins. This is uh, the basin where core 96 PC is located, right in that location. And we'll be looking at core 96 PC later. And uh, this is showing what, uh, we th what a turbidity current looks like in the laboratory. I didn't uh, record this video. And, uh, we have no reason to believe that uh, uh, turbidity currents in the real world don't look like this. And so here's a profile that uh, um, Postma put together. And uh, this shows, this was uh, uh, drawn uh, based on a series of video uh, recordings of a lab uh, uh, turbidity current, just like we just saw. And it shows how we have uh, two modes of deposition. We have this traction carpet that is uh, at, the, at the base of the turbidity, of the turbidity current, and then we have this turbulent flow that moves around smaller particles generally. And so as this turbidity current moves down slope, at any given location, that deposit is a time history of that turbidity current that passed by. So first, uh, we have this coarse sediment so the width of this is particle size. So the base of these the turbidites are sand. And then the top or the tail of these turbidites are mud, uh, silts, and clays. And uh, people have come up with classification systems for turbidites. And there's like the uh, BOMA sequence that I'll talk about momentarily. And so um, we want to come up with uh, proxies for particle size. Uh, because particle size is very time intensive to collect every half a centimeter, use a particle size analyzer, but we have geophysical data for all the cores, and I'll talk about that momentarily. But this shows if we have this idealized turbidite, what the, if we were to measure the density profile on that turbidite, it might look something like that. And then we might ask, well, what if our turbidite had multiple pulses? what the density profile might look like, and that's sort of our conceptual idea. If we see a density profile look like that, it might reveal something about the structure of the turbidate. So uh, here's a laundry list 
of turbidity current triggering mechanisms, non-unique. So we're not going to be able to say with any certainty that any one of these is responsible for triggering the turbidity current offshore Sumatra, but we can go through these one by one and talk about their likelihood, how likely might they be trigger, triggering these turbidity currents. And so I'm going to break these uh, triggering current, uh, these triggers into two groups. First, I'll mention the group that are highly unlikely to be responsible for turbidity currents offshore Sumatra based on the, ge the geography in Sumatra. And then uh, the second group are mechanisms that are more likely. But like I said, uh, uh, any of these are, impossibly re are possibly responsible for triggering the turbidity currents up up upslope up up of our core sites. So we can only speak of likelihood. So this is the first group. And I'll walk us through this. So uh, wave loads are generally uh, water depth limited. And uh, uh, Weiss uh, modeled tsunami waves in the Indian Ocean and found that uh, they don't exert enough um, force on the seafloor at depths deeper than about 335 meters. And the shallowest uh, setting in our uh, study area is about 750 meters. Uh, storm discharge. Uh, requires the site to be close to land, and uh, luckily we have four arc basins that isolate our core sites from land. Uh, volcanic explosions can trigger turbidity currents, <coughs> but we need to be close to those volcanoes, and all of our core sites are hundreds of kilometers from uh, these volcanoes. Uh, bolide impacts, their recurrence is, their global recurrence is on the order of thousands of years. Excuse me. Excuse me again. And uh, tidal currents are also water depth limited, so highly unlikely. These are uh, the ones that are left that are more likely. Um, and so let me just walk through ways that you might uh, criticize these. Uh, rapid sediment loads are generally regionally limited. Um, Subaerial or submarine self failure landslides are also uh, regionally limited. They usually just act locally. Uh, earthquakes, uh, those are regionally extensive. They might act upon a region that's uh, 100 to hundreds of kilometers long or wide. Tectonic oversteepening may not actually be a trigger. It might just precondition a slope. But if it were a trigger, it is also uh, regionally limited. It only acts where that fault is. And uh, gas hydrate destabilization, which also may not actually be a trigger. But if it is, those act locally. So. Um, regional correlation is a key element I'll use to address these non-unique uh, potential triggers, <coughs> and I also will spatiotemporarily correlate these turbidites, turbidites over a large region as this reduces the likelihood of many non-earthquake triggers for turbidity currents. So I'll spend a little time explaining why and how I'm correlating these deposits. So now we're in the methods section, and so uh, of course, this is the first part of the talk where we're talking about the sediment cores. And so I'm going to talk about the coring, how I'm correlating the turbidites using these different methods. And I'll spend a little time talking about uh, the age control. So here's our science crew. And uh, we got on a boat, or better known as a ship, the Roger Revelle, with our uh, Benny the Beaver MST van. And we have to be aware of insects in the tropical regions. They can be rather large. <laughs> and so we borrowed our uh, coring technique from the Spaniards from the 1500s when they were piston coring from schooners. And I hope no one believes me. And uh, so this is the piston core, the trigger core apparatus. And as soon as the trigger core hits the seafloor, it stops pulling down on the trigger, which releases the 5,000 kilogram a mass uh, driven piston core and this mass hits that piston uh, that's being held by the uh, this cable and then uh, we pull the core back up on site uh, up to the ship and start analyzing it but of course we had lots of problems and this is where we learned to talk like a pirate Arg! <laughs> because but luckily we had Chris Mosier with us the <coughs> come back kid so after two days of being stuck in the mud at, at uh, tension exceeding the elastic limit of the cable, about 24,000 pounds, 
We got our core back. Whoops. Okay. I'm roll with it. Um, there we go. And then we also had other uh, equipment breakdowns where we melted <laughs> most of the ship machines. <laughs> and so uh, we had to get the engineer and the crew to uh, fabricate this railroad track so we could uh, core off the stern of the ship. And uh, that limited core lengths to about 20 feet. And thanks to Danny Mitchell, uh, the chief engineer, for helping us with that. And once we get the core back up on, on the, uh, the deck, we chop it up into one and a half meter sections, run it through our multi-sensor track to collect different geophysical properties, such as magnetic susceptibility, gamma density, P-wave velocity, resistivity. Then we split the core, describe half of it, and scan the other half uh, with RGB imagery. Everyone knows the MST man lives in the MST man. That's Bart. And uh, after we got back to shore, uh, we spent a couple months uh, developing a protocol for scanning uh, CT scanning our sediment cores, Jason Weist, he'd be happy to help you. And I uh, selected the Beckman Coulter LS13320 uh, to do some particle size analysis here. Chris Ramzos can help you if you're interested in learning about that. And uh, we're interested in, uh, develop in uh, sort of benchmarking our geophysical properties with the particle size. And then we're also interested in, in just looking at the distribution of the particle size and the segments of our cores. So I mentioned there are uh, tripodite division classifications, and this is uh, the uh, Boma sequence, and then later Stone Piper came and broke out more divisions in the, in the, in the tripodite mud. And uh, this is useful for us because this entire sequence is not always uh, present in a core, and sometimes there will be repeated parts of that segment and, uh, of, the, of these divisions. And so if we have repeated divisions, that can reveal something about the turbidity current. If there are multiple uh, sediment flux pulses in the turbidity current, we would expect to see repeated uh, series of uh, these turbidite divisions. And this, uh, just threw this up here to show you what, a typical, what our typical core data look like. Uh, all the core data, I've worked up these, uh, along with the help of others, uh, all these data. So we have uh, gamma density and CT density, larger values to the left. The CT density is basically a line scan of the CT data, which is based on x-rays. So more dense is lighter gray, less dense is darker gray. And then we have uh, our lithologic logs that tells us something about the particle size and the structure or bedding in the turbidites. I threw up here, I have, uh, these are the turbidite divisions, and uh, from the lift logs we have texture, and this is uh, the magnetic susceptibility. In some cores we have radio carbon ages. Speaking of that, here are two cores. Here are some turbidites, and uh, the turbidites have reworked material, so we need to go to the sediment underlying them to get a good estimate of the age of emplacement of those turbidites. So these are uh, radiocarbon samples uh, locations. And Anne is not always just sitting around <laughs> reading, but uh, when she was training me how to pick 4Ms, she was definitely sitting down. And uh, these are the little 4Ms that are um, calcium carbonate shells and we use the carbon in them for ages. And all of our age analysis, uh, radiometric age analysis is based on radioactive decay at half-life. And uh, these different isotopes have different half-lives that tell you something about how far back in time they're useful. So for example, radiocarbon is useful to about 35,000. Some people extend it even further back in time. And then for the radiocarbon ages, I do some uh, age modeling with those uh, ages. First, I've got to convert them from uh, the half-life years or radiocarbon years to calendar years. Uh, that uses the variation of radiocarbon through time. Then I uh, apply a uh, marine reservoir correction because the uh, seawater has older radiocarbon than the atmosphere, and so that tends that makes the age distribution younger. These are probability density functions of, of the ages, so that's the marine reservoir correction. 
And then, uh, in many cases, there's a gap between the sample and the turbidite we're interested in. So that's our gap correction, which also makes it younger. And then we also can uh, put information into our model of the stratigraphic order. So we know that sample A is older than B, which is older than C. So we do some stratigraphic order uh, uh, corrections. And so you can see how uh, these age distributions shift slightly because of that. So I threw this in here just to remind us that we have um, why we are correlating um, our uh, turbidites, but also to introduce some, uh, a, a couple new ideas uh, that we're doing temporal correlations, and those temporal correlations are only for cores that are in the slope. Whereas the spatial correlations, we can correlate between the slope and the core sites. And also, that these correlations represent synchronous deposition. That means if we can correlate these turbidites that were deposited in minutes to hours, that it, um, it supports that, the, that they were deposited synchronously. And not only that they were deposited synchronously, <coughs> but the triggers that initiated their uh, deposition or erosion to deposition was also uh, short in time. And Risa likes my strategy, so we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> so now I'm going to uh, briefly talk about how I'm correlating <coughs> these deposits. So many of these are classic stratigraphic correlation tools. But I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the flattening of core geophysical property data because. Uh, we all drive around in cars, and we wouldn't be able to do that without this technique. So these are uh, some uh, drill, some cores, some drill holes that were drilled uh, across uh, ter tertiary fan deposits, which are uh, probably turbidites, these sands. And I'd like you to look at these two cores and look at the resistivity plot in purple. And we're going to look at these two units here, the M3 sand and the, the sands below it. And what you can see is that M3 sand is composed of two upwards finding <coughs> units. Now remember resistivity is a proxy for particle size. So to the left is larger values. And so at the base of the unit, you have larger particles and they get smaller as you go up. And then you have a step and then, then you have another upwards finding unit. And here you can also see that there are two upward finding units. And if you go down to the next unit, you'll see that here we have uh, two sequence up, uh, an upward coarsening unit followed by an upward fining unit. And then here in this core, we have an upward coarsening unit followed by an upward fining unit. Now I want you to note that these are not perfect matches, and so it requires a certain amount of interpretation of the geophysical data. And so now I'm going to walk you through how I <coughs> using our data to uh, flatten uh, these, uh, to correlate the structure of these turbidites. I'll quickly show you a map, I'll show you the cores, and then I'll show you the flattened data. Uh, here are these two core sites, 55 and 57, that are uh, down trench or, or downstream. This is Rob, sorry to interrupt. I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear you me? You need to unmute your mic. Oh, thanks. All right, everyone. Jay, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Please un unmute your mic. Yeah, it was working. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sorry for the interruption. No. Nope. My bad. No, thanks. Yes. Let's see here. Okay, so um, now I'll have to go a little bit over. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, here's the salient, and these are um, down, down slope of the salient, so their sediments are sourced locally. And uh, here are these two cores with nice big fat turbidites, and these are the stratigraphic con the tie lines that I'm going to be flattening the geophysical data to. And so on the left, we have 55 PC in the darker colors are 55, and I've taken 57 PC data that are in lighter colors 
and flatten them to the stratigraphic context, and you can see the really nice correlation. And I've done the op the other the flip flop for 57, and so uh, these are just amazing how well these correlate. It's very exciting. Uh, so now I'll get to some results. Uh, the, again, we're in the corn part of the talk. Here are all the cores that we collected. And uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about uh, the cores in this part of the world. And here we are in this part of the world. Here's core. Uh, these orange uh, uh, polygons uh, delineate the parts of the slope that drain towards these core sites. And you can see that they have unique sediment sources. Each of these core sites do, as does this uh, one of five PC. And uh, I've I put these cores in here, these, uh, this slide in here, to show you these five core sites. They have radiocarbon ages distributed throughout them, extending to about 8,000 years. And uh, this is the uh, particle-sized <coughs> proxy plot showing how um, useful the geophysical data are. So again, we have the density and magnetic susceptibility, and then this is the mean, median mode, and D10. <coughs> of the particle size, and this is resistivity. And so I'm just here to remind you that we're correlating the structure of the turbidites and not the geophysical data. And uh, so the fact that they are not perfect representations of the particle size data is not that important to us. Uh, there are reasons why the magnetic susceptibility, there might be some volcanic sediment in there that is changing how well as a proxy for particle size, or there might be some uh, biogenic uh, material. Here is a plot, of, um, a figure showing uh, the <coughs> uppermost turbidite in core 96 PC and TC, um, a composite core here. And uh, we found this uppermost turbidite in about a dozen cores. And uh, these are some key observations that are true for all of those cores uh, that represent something about the age of deposition. So they're all uh, soupy and unconsolidated. There's a lack of hemipelagic sediment in the core tops, and there's also a lack of oxidation in the core tops. And oxidation in uh, low organic flux sites probably takes about one to five years to develop. And if we uh, look in and zoom into the base of the turbidite, we can see that we have repeated uh, divisions. So we go from B to C, then back to B to C again, and back to B. So that might say something about the, uh, tur the heterogeneity of the turbidity current that led to this deposit. Uh, we also have some rip-up class that uh, uh, support the interpretation that this turbidite was erosive. And then we have a hemipelagic deposit here that you can see it's a little bit darker here or less dense. And that's where we're going to um, collect some radiocarbon material for uh, radiocarbon analysis. And not only did we find this, here's core 96 and 95, did we find this in core 96 and 95, but we think we also saw it in the seismic reflection. So here's that profile ending at the core site. Excuse me. And this is, I've outlined where I'm interpreting the 2004 deposit. And we think that we, I think we see, we think we see uh, the uh, coarse pulses of the turbidite here. And it's possible that there are uh, prior large sized turbidites further down in the section. Woohoo! <laughs> and then uh, this is a plot showing the age data that we have for this deposit. So if you look at uh, 96 BC and 102 M, M multi core, which is co located at uh, core 103, which is over here, here's 96. Here's the rate of carbon age of 110 before 1950, uh, which is something like 1840 um, from that hemipelagic segment. But if we consider the gap correction, remember the gap correction, we model the age of that turbidite to be minus 60 before present, which is 1950. So we come up with a radiocarbon, a modeled radiocarbon age of from 2010, which is after our cruise. Um, and then here is 102 uh, MC where we have a 30 plus or minus 60 before present. And then we also have a lead 210 data, 
which shows an exponential uh, decay with depth. And if we combine these, none of these say zero age, but if we combine these along with the, the data about the ox lack of oxidation, we can say that we we're pretty confident that this was deposited following the 2004 earthquake. Uh, discussion, so I'll discuss the correlations, paleoseismic implications, and recurrence. So uh, obviously we can't see much on this plot other than I have uh, uh, ranked my correlations, which are represented by these green tie lines, uh, by uh, line thickness and pattern in terms of how certain I think they are based on the different ways I've correlated them. And uh, we can take a closer look at uh, a few of these turbidites from these four cores, and uh, we'll zoom in and look at my correlations. And so I've grouped the density and MAGSUS data, and I want you to look closely at the CT density, and you can see how these uh, uh, proxies for particle size or turbidite structure uh, trend nicely with each other. So that's very exciting. And this is the uh, H uh, model for core 104 PC. I just want to zoom in and show you how the H distributions, this was the uh, age distribution before we included the stratigraphic constraint or prior, and this is the corrected age distribution. So we've done this for all of our sediment cores. And uh, this is the resulting space-time diagram uh, showing the correlations and the resulting rated carbon age, um, ages that we've interpreted using our age model. And if we zoom in to the upper section, uh, we can also see that I am also plotting paleo tsunami and paleo earthquake records in, of the region. And we can look at the recurrence of those uh, of deposits. And depending on how you correlate them, uh, the recurrence interval of tsunamis in this region ranges between 280 to about 320 years. So if we look at our turbidites, and if we calculate the recurrence interval by averaging the time in between earthquakes in each core and calculate the mean interseismic time, I come up with a 260 plus or minus 160 year recurrence interval, which is completely consistent with the paleo tsunami records. So that's very exciting. And then secondly, I examine the recurrence interval for these four cores as a test of my correlations. And so if my correlations are good, then the recurrence intervals should track through <coughs> the cores. And if the correlations, if the recurrence interval doesn't track through the cores, then there are some problems with my correlations. And we can see that the recurrence interval on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis or turbidite number, that these recurrence intervals do indeed track all the way perfectly uh, through the cores. So that's very exciting. And arm waving time, uh, the heterogeneity of the turbidite structure may be related to uh, the seismogenic information that we have for the set of, for the heterogeneity of the slip of this earthquake. And we'll have to do more work on that. So now I'm going to quickly go through the slip stability stuff and record time. And I did uh, two uh, slip stability analysis, uh, 2D profiles. Remember, uh, force balance between these rectangular shaped slices along the slide plane. And I uh, used some material properties from cores. And here are some 2D profiles. And we're going to look at this 2D profile, which is upslope of these two cores. And first, I applied 0G load, so static factor safety. Then I applied a 1G load. And then I back calculated uh, incrementally lower seismic loads for these um, uh, analyses to find what the critical acceleration was for each site. So here is the static factor safety at this site. It's above 1, so it's stable with no earthquake loads. At 1G, it's very unstable, very much below 1. But uh, if we do it at a critical acceleration, we find that the critical acceleration is somewhere around 0.02G, which is really low. Um, and if considering all 83 or 84 uh, slice sites, uh, the mean critical acceleration is 0.04 g. And now I'll talk about uh, the infinite slope, slope stability analysis and ground motion modeling. 
Uh, we looked at repeat ground acceleration. This is how Arius intensity, which is another measure of ground motion, how it also diminishes with distance from the fault based on a variety of different factors. And then I also, I had to build a fault slab model so that everywhere on the seafloor, I know the distance to the fault. And then I also, then, uh, so those are for generic earthquakes, and then I took a specific, this is a specific earthquake, the 2004 earthquake modeled by Sorensen using the Yagi uh, slip model, represented by those rectangles, and I used uh, peak ground acceleration to drive my uh, slope stability model, and of course it's a, once again, it's a force balance between this uh, sediment overlying some uh, slight plane, and so I'm going to walk you through the results, areas intensity, PGA, and uh, slope uh, displacement. Uh, so nicely, PGA and areas intensity uh, diminish with distance from the fault. Uh, this also shows that in plan view, how the uh, darker green, larger PGA is closer to the fault, and it, and it diminishes with <coughs> distance from the fault. This is for magnitude 6, 7, 8, and 9 earthquakes. And uh, these are, this is the result of uh, uh, the factor safety analysis for the 2004 earthquake. And everywhere that's green is unstable during the earthquake. And you can see that these cores uh, appear to have a different <coughs> amount of slope stability on the slopes that deliver sediment to them than these cores. So now I'm uh, going to walk you through the discussion of these uh, the results. Uh, so I'm going to look. We're going to look at uh, the ground motion conditions for some of these core for these four core sites. We'll look at generic earthquakes, and we'll look at the 2004 earthquake and see if we can uh, find any relations between the site conditions and the sediment record. So uh, these are PGA and area intensity versus slope uh, for four magnitude earthquakes for each of these four different slope basin sites. And uh, the main takeaway is that for any, uh, in any earthquake of a given magnitude, each of these core sites has a similar range of uh, shaking intensity. And these ranges are narrower for PGA and uh, broader for areas intensity. But if uh, you follow my shaking LED light here, laser light, You'll see in green is the magnitude 9, and they still, um, sh these four core sites <coughs> still share a similar range of uh, shaking intensity. And then for the magnitude 8 in red are, is, is right here. So even though there are wider ranges, they still share a similar range of shaking intensity for a generic earthquake. So uh, air's intensity, that range increases with magnitude. And with PGA, the range decreases with magnitude. And <laughs> what the heck? Well, it's because these, so these are uh, measurements uh, plotted, uh, areas intensity and PGA plotted versus the fault distance. And uh, we, sh we see that the, that the range in ground motions relates to the attenuation curves. So these attenuation curves are slightly different. And that accounts for the difference in uh, uh, ground motion received at each of those sites, so people have to consider that when they choose an attenuation relation. Now here I'm plotting PGA from Sorensen on the horizontal axis and the fault distance on the vertical axis, and the first thing that we see, remember this is for a specific 2004 earthquake, is nicely there's a positive correlation for each of these sites, positive correlation between PGA and fault distance, so that's nice. Um, but uh, they don't you know, have a similarly overlapping range like we saw for a generic <coughs> earthquake. And uh, this is probably because the distance to the slope contours that we saw and the difference in uh, slope stability we saw um, a few slides ago. So let's compare this to the turbidite thickness in these cores and we see that there's an inverse relation between turbidite thickness and PGA. So that uh, ground motion was not responsible for the turbidite thickness in these cores. So probably side effects controlled the thickness during the 2004 earthquake. Uh, 
we're looking at the seismic reflection. Here are some uh, uh, sites that are promising to show that we can go back further than the depth of the cores to look at the paleoseismic history. And uh, also in the future, I'm working, we're going to be working on the paleomagnetic record. Here's the intensity for 70 PC, 72 PC that has radio carbon ages in it. And this is the model of, at this latitude and longitude from Corte et al. 2007. And then for the intensity data, you can see how these peaks and in intensity nicely line up. So that's a promising record. And of course, I'll be working with Joe Stoner from the, on that project. So the takeaway message, I um, can't believe I'm only five minutes over, um, is that for the 2004 seismoturbidite, hopefully you all understand what a seismoturbidite is, even though I didn't directly tell you. Uh, you can infer, based on the presentation, that we identified it in 12 cores, and we imaged it in the subsurface. And it, and it was probably not the first magnitude 9 regional earthquake in that area. And radiometric and observations of relative age, oxidation, support our conclusion. <coughs> Uh, the second main uh, takeaway is that I've come up, I've come up, I've, come, I've, deter I've estimated the recurrence interval for uh, using 28 uh, past earthquakes over the last six and a half thousand years to be about 260 years, though it varies through time when we looked at the recurrence interval through time in the cores. And uh, ground motions and geomorphology, that slip heterogeneity and site factors control uh, seismic Turbidite deposition offshore Sumatra, those site factors dominate the deposition following the 2004 earthquake. I'd like to thank all the people on this list. I'll quickly name the Captain Tom Desjardins, uh, Danny Mitchell, Chief Engineer of the Ravel, Dr. Russell Wynn and Stefan Ladaj, and Ken Ikahara, Ikahara-san from Japan, uh, COAS students, Bob Porter, Sarah Strano, Summer Pretorius, Brand Black, Morgan Earhart, Jeff Beeson, and Amy Monica Garrett. Uh, Corning technicians, Chris Mosier, Paul Walzak, and Bob Wilson. And a number of student volunteers, including <coughs> Mo and Bart. And of course, Dr. Ann Mori, Dr. Joe Stoner, and Dr. Chris Ramzos. And lastly, Dr. Chris Goldfinger. Thank you very much. Well, that was quite a ride. You could loosen up your seatbelts a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, Jay's done a, just an amazing array of stuff, and you, what you could see in an hour is just the tip of the iceberg. But, uh, really nice stuff. So, questions from the audience? Yes. Okay, um, I just have a question on your current table. Yes. Um, was that for a particular magnitude range? Or how do you, I mean, so you, you measured your current, what size of earthquake is that recurrence? Um, I actually uh, was thinking uh, in last week that I, what I should do is take the uh, latitudinal distance of those correlations and, and sort of come up with the magnitude estimate for those turbidites that I've correlated, which I haven't done. Um, but there are probably, they could be, earthquake trigger landslides can be as small as a magnitude 4. Um, but as we looked at the attenuation relations, that the you know the, the ground motions diminish rapidly, uh, especially with magnitude. So my ballpark guess is that there are probably magnitude sevens or greater. Um, the the subduction zone, the historic subduction zone earthquakes in that region were all in the mid sevens. Um, so does that make sense with the convergence rate, given the accumulation of strain that you expect? The, if, if, you, uh, take, if you assume a coupling ratio of 1, the recurrence interval is, and, and assuming a slip similar to the 2004 earthquake, the recurrence interval is somewhere around four to 600 years, depending on how you, how you look at it. So it is consistent with the convergence rate, and there are other estimates of convergence that people have made in that region that range from 500 to 1,000 years. So they're not too inconsistent with that, at least by an order of magnitude. So, does that help? Yes. Um, yeah, about your occurrence intervals again, they seem to hinge on your correlations, um, how they're spaced in time. 
um, you said those correlations had a certain confidence. Um, how do you determine that confidence? Is it a quantitative statement, or is it more you have like physical data to look at, like the relationship between the two? Uh, largely, uh, it's driven by the geophysical flattening, the correlation of the turbidite structures. And in the upper uh, part of the section, where I could directly compare it with the tsunami recurrence intervals, which the ages are pretty consistent. The paleo tsunami ages are pretty consistent with many of our uh, turbidite ages. Um, so the certainty is, is definitely qualitative, um, but there are radiocarbon ages that, that do provide some sort of constraint, some boundary conditions for the correlations. So uh, if you look at the down core recurrence intervals and how they didn't perfectly line up, I could have a correlation off by one or two, but that wouldn't change the recurrence interval significantly. So just like if you look at the uh, tsunami recurrence interval, depending on how you correlate, I'm correlating other people's work, and so no one's correlated them before, and so I'm just throwing them in a box, and if the two sigma ranges don't overlap, then I'm saying there are different tsunamis. Um, so the recurrence intervals are sort of consistent with those recurrence intervals. Um, yes, Andrew. Nice job, Dave. Thanks, I learned a lot. Uh, I, I read a paper, I think it was last fall, about the Japanese earthquake and the, tur and the turbidity current that was generated during that, in which they showed quite clearly that the uh, coast seismic uplift of the seafloor occurred several hours before the turbidity current actually arrived at the site. <clears throat> and they interpreted that to be a tsunami generated turbidity current rather than a ground motion generated current as you have interpreted here. I'm wondering whether you can still throw out tsunami entrainment of sediment from shallower depths to explain either a turbidity current or a complexity in a turbidity current beyond site factors, which I'm not sure what those are. Uh, site factors being um, the, how the, the sediments are in a certain site and how the ground motions might propagate through those sediments, or how the geomorphology of the, uh, of the slopes direct those turbidity currents to a site. So that's what I mean by site effects. Um, I cannot rule out uh, so any of those triggering mechanisms. Uh, I wasn't there to observe those, those depositions. Yeah, yeah. However, the, um, so certainly it's possible, uh, even if you know, uh, people who are, who are experts in modeling wave propagation suggest that they uh, don't exert a large enough force deeper than about 330 meters, which is half the depth of our shallowest uh, source areas for our cores. So, right, but but the but, thing I would yeah. ask you about is, do you have to only have locally sourced sediment? Why not, if you get sediment suspended in the water column, can't that be transported to the site? I mean, you see, for example, in videos of tsunamis, trucks, and various other things going into suspension. Uh, well, the sand, we have lots of sand in our turbid, turbidites. And so I suspect that that sand wouldn't be suspended in the water column. So I could probably, we could probably rule that out, uh, even though we, we don't want to rule statue. anything out, yeah. just because we weren't there to observe it. <coughs> yeah. um, this is actually a plot of uh, unpublished data. So we've got to blame uh, my advisor for sharing this with me and Kenny Kahara for sharing it with him. Uh, and this shows uh, the waveform envelope. Here's the uh, Tohoku Oki earthquake waveform envelope. And this is a line scan of the CT data. And it is just fantastically cor correlative here. Um, but this is further down slope. Apparently, uh, further up slope, there were two turbidites, and one of them was uh, probably the ground motion triggered turbidite, and the other one was probably a tsunami triggered turbidite, because the tsunami triggered turbidite actually has season 134 from Fukushima in it, whereas the lower turbidite doesn't, if I remember that correctly. So um, that doesn't directly help us, but I thought I'd mention it. Since you brought it up. Uh, just a second. Ray, Ray. Yeah, so 
in the end, I couldn't really count them all, but what fraction of your turn guides did you actually correlate and thus think they're seismogenic? And what fraction do you think are other causes? Um, oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have a good answer for that. You mean half or more? More than half. <coughs> about two thirds of the t of the twenty eight turbidites for the last six and a half k a are high more highly certain. So, um, so essentially, your conclusion is that essentially every turbidite you see is like every no, but the turbidites that I can correlate ah, okay, so are how likely many are uncorrelatable, or how many did you not correlate? There are a number of um, muddy turbidites that I was unable to correlate. So uh, t turbidites that have a higher dynamic range of sediment, so they have lots of coarse sediment and also fine sediment, they have a larger dynamic range, so their, their uh, geophysical signature is going to be more <coughs> unique, whereas muddy turbidites have a smaller dynamic range and particle size and density, so their signature, their geophysical signature is not going to be as unique. And so it's harder to correlate those muddy turbidites. And so I didn't um, spend much time correlating those muddy turbidites. And so there are probably as many muddy turbidites that I didn't correlate as there are more coarse sandy turbidites that I did correlate. And those might be locally, those might be related to other uh, triggering mechanisms. There are lots of uh, faults, as we saw in the accretionary prism, uh, that, could, that could also trigger uh, turbidity currents. But it's more difficult to correlate those turbidites just because their geophysical properties are not unique. So all the robust ones, well, yes. essentially that is the source of turbidites in these spaces. Likely. <laughs> Can I drop here? I just want, I didn't understand your answer to Andrew's question. Maybe I didn't understand the question, but he was saying that, that the, sor the source could be really shallow, right? The tsunami generated uh, turbidite, and you were arguing that it was maybe deeper because of the presence of sand. Uh, I think Andrew is saying that, um, that, uh, Tsunamis that might trigger suspension of sediment into the sea column might transport, that sediment might be transported in the sea column into deeper locations. And I mentioned that because most of our turbidites are, that I'm correlating are, have sand in them, that that sand is, is, I don't think that that sand is going to be suspended in the sea column. It's going to be the sand uh, tends to uh, transport uh, at the base of the slope along with uh, traction flow, whereas the uh, finer particles are the ones that are transported by turbulence and might uh, go, you know, to hundreds of meters in ca some cases. So, uh, so I can't rule it out, but it just seems less likely. Does that help? No. <laughs> Okay. The key missing point is you're drilling in isolated basins, so they're physically disconnected from a downfall flow from the coast. Definitely, definitely. And there are, so the only way that you could get sediment in those basins would be uh, drop, you know, dropping out out of the sea column, the, the, the water column. So we definitely, definitely, I wasn't there, but it seems highly, highly, highly unlikely that we're going to get coarse sediment at our core sites from sites that are shallow enough to be um, uh, sheared or um, pulsing uh, cyclic loading from a tsunami or storm waves. Um. So another question. Um, I think there's a couple of coral dated. Um, earthquakes in that area. Do they agree in age with your most recent events? Yeah, let's look at that in the plot. I forget they're back to about four events now in that area or something like that. There we go. So uh, 
These purple dots represent uh, Aaron Meltzner's uh, coral microatoll. So these show evidence of uplift or substance during earthquakes as the corals either uplift out of uh, the living zone or subside um, or then they uh, get cut by the wave, waves. And so uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that, that each of these techniques or methods or whatever, uh, paleo tsunami, turbidites, and coral microatoll, each has a different sensitivity to what they are going to represent, what type of deformation they're going to represent. So uh, tsunamis probably uh, require a, you know, a larger magnitude earthquake, and the, the coral macroatolls might be sensitive to smaller magnitude earthquakes. So, um, so here's uh, these lines, these dotted lines represent the mean age using our, the age model for our events. Um, so I have an event at about 650 years BP and an event at 310 years BP, and you can see that Aaron Meltzner. <coughs> now, these dots represent corals on the northern half of Similu Island, which are probably co-located with, if, if there is a segment, the boundary that ends at Similu, the Similu Saddle, that these probably represent earthquakes that happen on that segment, and these might uh, represent earthquakes. These are from the southern part of Similu, um, and they might represent earthquakes on a different segment. We don't know that if that's true or not, and we can't not say whether or not these are all subduction zone, evidence of subduction zone earthquakes. There are upper plate faults on Similu, and uh, that may indeed um, be responsible for some of those earthquakes. So, um, but certainly, uh, here if we look at, oh, I don't have Curie C's. I think I deleted it. If you go further south to the Medawai uh, part of the subduction zone, the Medawai segment of the subduction zone, uh, Kerry C has also has more, there are more coral microatoll uh, records in the southern <coughs> part of the subduction zone. Oh, I really want to show you this other plot. Um, the mouse. I've got a better plot here with the historic earthquakes. And so the, here we go. So the, um, uh, I don't actually have Curie C's data it's plotted here. So here's Cibolo Island, where those uh, Aaron Meltzner coral microatolls are. And here are the coral microatolls uh, sites in the southern part of the margin. There are also some on Neos that, uh, that Curie C uh, links, uh, interprets that there are these uh, super cycles. Um, and so that there are clusters of earthquakes uh, for adjacent fault segments that occur over a decade or so, and then there's quiescent for a couple centuries, and then there are a couple large earthquakes. Uh, this is the 1797 and 1893 uh, pair. And, uh, oh gosh, as I was looking for this slide, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, that's right. So if you look at Aaron Meltzner, if you compare Aaron Meltzner's ages with our ages, it looks like that uh, some of that there are that uh, Aaron's coral macro atoll data that there are there might be several uh, linked uh, earthquakes over a short time period that are separated by larger time periods that might that might be similar to the super cycles that um, they carry C sees. Where was Similu on that map? Where is the relation? Oh, yeah. So uh, Similu is right here, which is the island uh, that is sort of in between the 2005 earthquake and the 2004 earthquake. And something else I noticed, so since I've got this slide up here, is uh, if you look at, so here's 2004, and then uh, in this region, the historic earthquakes are uh, and then sevens, I've listed them here if you want to look them up. So these are in the mid to upper sevens, here, here, and here. And um, there were no historic earthquakes here, which is where the largest slip was during 2004. Well, if we look at, I've colored in the 20th century um, 
and early 21st century earthquakes in color, whereas the other prehistoric earthquakes are in yellow. And you can see that there is this large gap here. And uh, Chile et al. modeled the slip deficit and found that the 2007 and um, 2007 earthquake, which was uh, 8.4 and then uh, 7.9. Uh, didn't release a lot of that strain, and so um, this might be a location of future larger slip, just like this was was here. Um, just more arm waiting. Yes. Uh, when did you do your recording? Uh, uh, to, uh, summer of 2007. So, uh, how did you distinguish like 2004 and 2005? And then, because you are all over there. Can you see the differences? Uh, because, uh, in fact, probably 2005 is probably more of an influence on your data than 2004, yeah? Um, let's see. So Maybe here's all a, those dots are. Here's a plot that shows, I didn't spend any time on <coughs> this because I went through it uh, quickly. Um, so here are the slip contours in five meter steps mm -hmm. of 2005 and 2004. And remember, these slip, con you know, these slip models are just estimates, and there are lots of slip models, and none of them agree with each other. But I put these here because I like them; they're cute. Uh, no, not really. Uh, Chile at all. I like, you know, his checkerboard you know, seems to justify the slip model. But uh, in these these larger, so these larger orange circles are cores, represent cores, that I think that we have the 2004 deposit in. These smaller circles are cores that, uh, that don't have, that either didn't have, a lot of these cores didn't have any sediment in them. Uh, these two cores, actually there are four cores there, don't have 2004, uh, but the, the sites are low relief, there's lots of bioturbation, and really low sedimentation rates. So at 20 centimeters, we're looking at 10,000 years. So I'm not surprised. I learned we learned a lot about uh, where to put core sites, and you definitely want to be in a setting that has some high relief, locally high relief, because uh, all along the margin, if we found if, uh, some of our cores we collected, now we really needed to collect cores in the slope basins because for radiocarbon, but if they were <coughs> low relief, I realized that those are really bad core sites. So, um, so I think we have the 2004 deposit here based on the geophysical properties of the deposit. But overlying the 2004 deposit, I think that we have a 2005 turbidite in, uh, in one of these cores. And then here's a multi-core that I think that we have a 2005 turbidite in. And um, now... And how do you know that it's not 2005, the 88 DC? So the reason, oh, why do I think that there's yeah. a, two, a 2005? I don't, it's 2004. I don't know any of this, right? Because just like seismologists and sedimentologists, we don't know anything, right? So I don't know any of this. We don't, yeah, we know nothing. That's the philosophy of science, right? So all we can do is test our hypothesis, you know, never know anything, especially since you weren't there to look at it, all right? So if we look at 88, um, at the trigger core at 88, there is a, um, there is a turbidite that has a very unique geophysical signature. And then on top of that, that, that looks a lot like uh, the geophysical signature in core 96. And then on top of that is another smaller, muddier turbidite. And then, so, so that supports that that may have both 2004 and 2005 in it. And it's not a surprise that it might contain 2004 because it's in the trench, where, we, where the trench is going downslope in this direction. Here's the five kilometer contour. So the trench is flowing down like that. Um, this here, we have, there's a lead to 10 and radiocarbon that support the recency of deposition. <coughs> There is a lack of oxidation and no uh, hemipelagic sediment in the core tops, also supportive of a, of, of a recent deposition. And I would argue that it's probably the 2005 deposit um, for, two, for the recency, for the structure, doesn't uniquely look like the 2004 deposits. 
probably less qualitative. And also that it's uh, sedimentary sources, which are also a highly local, you know, are in a small region like this, that it is much closer to the, to the 2005 slip than the 2004 slip. So, but knowing that uh, ground motions dis, uh, diminish greatly with distance, and this core site is, you know, it's about uh, 70 kilometers from the five meter slip contour, I'm interpreting that to be uh, resulting from the 2005. Should I walk you through that? Yeah. All right. Um, um, this slide is a question. I'm, I'm looking for the differences between uh, the turbidite record in Cascadia and Sumatra. And so I'm wondering, why, is, why are the turbidites all so close to the French in Sumatra, whereas in Cascadia they go way the heck out on the people's plate? Oh, that's a great question. Um, in, in Cascadia, uh, the sedimentation history of the uh, seafloor offshore Cascadia is uh, represents the glacial history and so there are large uh, turbidity current channel systems that tend to pro propagate those turbidite turbidity currents for large distances whereas in Sumatra uh, in the northern part of uh, the Bengal uh, of the Indian Ocean there's the Bengal fan but during uh, the uh, uh, quaternary, sometime in the Pleistocene, uh, the trench was cut off from sedimentation from the Bengal fan, and so uh, there are no large uh, cha uh, trench parallel uh, channel systems resolvable in multi-beam data. So there actually is, over here, there is a relic turbidity current channel system, but there is the outer rise due to the flexure of the uh, downgoing plate there's a, there's a hump in topography here, and the turbidity current channel actually goes towards the 90 east ridge and not towards the trench. So um, I think that it largely has to do with the, the sedimentation history and the lack of channels that allowed those sediments to deposit for further distances in Cascadia, whereas uh, we don't have those channelized systems here. So it seems like they they sort of like, they get to the sea floor, and there might be some propagation down the trench, um, but uh, certainly not like in Cascadia. You don't, have, you don't have a topographic trench on Cascadia that you do here. So let's say if you go to Chile, and you get to southern Chile, if you have the same situation, no uh, topographic trench. So would you expect in southern Chile to see a Cascadia type record? And yeah, in the parts of Chile where there is a larger uh, history of sediment supply, there are channels. Uh, someone presented a poster AGU and they were uh, showing where they were tracking the uh, channel through part of the trench. And so I would have to just have my mind, you know, I have to have to look at a map and see if there are channels in the in the trench and that would you know help qualify my answer but certainly in the regions of the trench where the uh, down going Nazca plate is acting like chainsaw uh, because there's no sediment overlying the down going structures I would I would guess that those uh, turbidites might be more localized as they are here as they are here Great questions. I wonder if you if you were to do a do a project say off in Myanmar, which is the location of the 1762 earthquake, which may be off the rest of the I know you have a tremendous amount of sediment supply. If you wouldn't get a Cascadia type record rather than a Sumatra type. Yeah, and there are active channels uh, up there. So <coughs> I would yeah. I suspect that the Indians let us pour in, pour in their international waters, we might have uh, better luck at finding a record like Cascadia compared to Sumatra, the further south of Sumatra. Uh, couldn't, couldn't get.
Yeah, yeah, couldn't get the third. The X Y Z. My flag is down the whole time. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you.